This video is the first of three episodes where I talk about how to not lose your bird of prey. This first episode is how to avoid losing your bird of prey in the first place. The second episode will be how to get a bird down from a tree, for example, that's reluctant to do so. And the third episode will be ways to find your bird if you've just got no idea where it's gone. So welcome back to the channel. My name is Ryan. I'm the head falcon at Owl Adventures with over 14 years of experience working with birds of prey. And I've got quite a lot of experience in this very field when flying our birds as well. So I'm going to give you some of that information now to help you with your falconry journey. Now, firstly, how do we avoid losing our bird in the first place? Well, the following steps will certainly help. Step one is to condition your bird as best you can. This comes down to partly the rearing of the bird. Is it hand reared? Is it parent reared and manned later? Has it been socially reared? And then it's also trying your best to make it really used to its surroundings, where it's flying, who it's flying with, and any distractions it may have. I'll give you an example of one of my birds that's really well conditioned. Henrietta, my eagle owl, who's currently 22 years old, at the time of this video being filmed in 2024 for reference, she will normally fly at about five pounds and about three ounces. There's quite a bit of leeway in her flying weight because she is such a large bird. Now, I can actually fly her free at a slightly higher weight and indoors where she can't escape somewhere, like in a school hall, for example, I can fly her at an even higher weight, like five pound, eight, nine even, and she behaves exactly the same as she would do at the lower weight. And that's because she's done so much of that work and activity that she become really conditioned to it. When she gets out of the box at a venue, be it be indoor or outdoor, she knows it's a safe environment, she trusts her environment, she trusts me, and she generally performs okay, even if she's not necessarily right down at that kind of flying weight where she should be. Now that principle doesn't work with all birds of prey. Lanner falcons, for example, are one of those birds that kind of need to be bang on flying weight to fly properly wherever they are. But still, conditioning is a big part of the way of ensuring your bird is less likely to be spooked by something and fly off. And number two, it's how we actually train our birds. The better trained your bird of prey is, the better it will be at flying and the less likely it will be to actually not fly away, essentially. So, you want to be recalling it to the glove or to a lure. If it's a hawk, for example, or even an owl, that you wouldn't traditionally fly to a lure, it's still a good idea to use a lure as a backup. Because you've got to remember that sometimes, if a bird is distracted, it may not wish to fly to your hand, but it may be happy enough to get what looks like a free meal on a lure. So the more flying you do, the better, ideally in different locations, which brings me on to point number three. The location where you fly your bird could be the very difference between losing it and not losing it. So if you think, I've only really got one suitable location near me to fly my bird, then probably only fly it in that location. And the benefit there is your bird's gonna get really used to that particular location. It'll get to know the layout really well, know what the risks are, are, probably not care about the risks that were there in the start and probably fly okay every time in that particular venue and if you only ever do that then take it to another venue you could have a problem otherwise probably do what I do which is to take your bird to lots of different venues kind of easy for me because as my career involves taking birds to different venues to fly them they've always got opportunities to fly in different places but this can additionally help to in a way condition your bird for the different venues so it's less distracted. You also want to look at where you are for any possible risks that may scare your bird, like big dogs running free, other animals. One of the main reasons why your bird may get distracted or spooked or fly away would be things like crows and magpies, also seagulls and even blackbirds, because they will mob your bird, especially in the spring and summer when they've got young, because they think your bird of prey is gonna eat their babies. 
and maybe it will if it gets close enough. So they will attack them, mob them, and it depends on the bird. Your bird may not care. I've got certain birds like my Harris hawks who don't really care at all if they're getting mobbed by crows, they just ignore them. And I've got other birds like barn owls and things that can get a bit scared and distracted if they get mobbed quite a bit by those birds. It's not always as easy as it sounds though. You can't always turn up to a venue, have a look around and think, are there any crows around? Because sometimes you don't know if there are any around until you actually fly your bird. Number four is of course to monitor the flying weight of your bird. You need to find where the flying weight is and when you're confident at the right weight, fly your bird free and try and stick to that flying weight. And you've got to think about all the different elements that can affect a flying weight. How much the bird flew the day before, how much food it's eaten, the weather, the temperature, the wind speeds, these can all be factors in the flying weight. But with a bit of practice, you should get quite au fait with that. And that brings me on to number five, which is looking at the temperament of your bird before you fly it. Is it on the glove, about to fly, but looks distracted and concerned, or is it looking at your food bag and looking excited to go. I've mentioned before on this channel about using a crayons, which is a line attached to the bird. You could possibly go to a venue, attach the crayons, pop it on a perch. Will it fly to your hand if it does that straight away? You've probably got enough confidence to think, right, I'll take the crayons off and let it fly free. Also, before flying your bird free for the first time, take lots of pictures of it for reference, just in case, and also register it with the IBR, the Independent Bird Register, and at least that way, if someone finds your bird, they'll be able to phone the IBR, give them the reference number on the ring around the leg, and you can have your bird reunited that way. And finally, number six, before flying our birds, we want to ensure that we add some useful furniture. This is the term we use for anything the bird's wearing. So we want to remove things like muse jesses and swivels, but we want to add things like bells. These can be useful because you can then hear your bird as it flies. And if it flies into a tree and it's quite a dense tree, lots of foliage, and you can't see it, you'll still be able to hear it. And that's the way that people actually used to track their birds many, many years ago before telemetry came along. Which leads me to the last point really, which is to add a working transmitter, whether it be a radio transmitter or a GPS transmitter. As long as it's working with a fresh, fully charged battery, this is possibly the thing that saves the day and will allow you to track your bird if it does fly off because of some kind of distraction or something else. Now, the next episode, we're going to talk about things that don't greatly relate to the GPS. We're going to talk in the next episode about how to get a bird down that just sat there looking non-responsive. And the third episode is how to find your bird if you can't find it at all because the GPS isn't working or there's some other issue and tips on how to do that. Feel free to watch those right now. I've uploaded them at the same time.